every time you eat a food, you are consuming thousands of different molecules that can have a immediate and significant effect on how your brain is wired and how your brain functions. Specific to plants, there are over 300,000 edible plant species on planet Earth, and each of these plants contains a different cohort of these molecules some of which can again have a dramatic impact on how our brains work. So this is far more than just saying that plant-based foods contain macronutrients, vitamins, and minerals. What we're talking about here is that data is being transferred to our bodies that changes the way that our brains work. The way that our brains work is the foundation uh, that drives how we think, that drives how we feel, that drives our action. So. In this video, we're going to be talking about how certain plants contain certain molecules that can have a outsized effect on our brain function. From the focus and the attention that comes from having a cup of coffee that contains caffeine to the mind-altering effects of plant-based psychedelics, plant molecules have a significant effect on the brain, our central computer. If you've ever wondered about some of the science, if you have any interest in the topic of nutritional neurochemistry and neurobiology, you are going to enjoy this video. This is a uh, jumping into the fascinating world of how our brains can substantially, dramatically influence our brain function. I'm Dr. Austin Perlmutter. I'm a brain researcher. I'm a brain educator. And if you're just slightly nerdy around the topic of food and neuroscience, you're going to want to watch this video all the way until the end. Two quick notes. The first one is that because we'll be discussing topics like psychedelics, I really want to emphasize this video is for educational purposes only. It's not medical advice. And second, if you're interested to learn more, if you have any interest in getting to understand the incredible world of brain science and topics like how our food and how sleep and how exercise change our brains, definitely subscribe to this channel. There's lots more content here. There really is no part of our body that is, is so that is so tethered to our sense of self as our brains. From our brain wiring to our brain function, the reality is that how we think, how we act, how we feel, uh, our beliefs, our likes, our dislikes, our actions, these are all a manifestation of what is happening in this three pound organ that sits inside of our skulls. Even though you might feel like the same you tomorrow compared to today or today compared to yesterday, the reality is that your brain is constantly changing as a reflection of your outer environment and your inner environment. And many, many things alter these environments and therefore our brains, but there are certain plants and compounds found within these plants that have an outsized influence on our brains. So we're going to be exploring in this video four of the most powerful of these brain active plant molecules, the sources of these molecules where they're found in nature, their effects on the brains, and some of the implications of this research on what makes us us and how we think, how we act, and how we feel. The first molecule that we're going to be talking about as incredibly relevant to this conversation, and certainly the most popular brain altering molecule that happens at a high level that is found within our diets is going to be caffeine. Caffeine is a naturally occurring stimulant. It's found in a number of different plant species. Some of the most concentrated and popular sources of caffeine in our diet are going to be coffee beans and subsequently coffee, tea leaves and subsequently tea, and cacao beans, which converts into, as I'm sure you know, chocolate. Caffeine is also found in a number of other naturally occurring plants, for example, yerba mate. But generally speaking, for most people, the natural food sources of caffeine in our diet, the top sources are going to be coffee and tea. Caffeine has a very significant, for those who have used it, and that's actually most people, effect on our brains. But what does it actually do? To understand this, we need to know that as we go through the day, our brains build up a molecule called adenosine. The idea is that as adenosine levels go up and as adenosine binds to its receptor, we tend to experience more drowsiness. And so adenosine is thought to in part be a reflection of the brain's use of energy, specifically ATP, adenosine triphosphate. The bottom line here though is that adenosine builds up 
And when it binds to receptors, it leads to drowsiness. It leads to us feeling a little bit sleepier. But caffeine binds to the adenosine a receptor and replaces adenosine's binding. When this happens, it actually leads us to feel more alert. It also appears to increase the release of neurotransmitters like dopamine and norepinephrine. And these are neurotransmitters that are linked to things like motivation and alertness and enhance cognitive performance. This can help certain people, myself included, to feel like we're more focused, to feel like we're less fatigued. It doesn't necessarily work in the same way for every person. And something I want to make very clear here is that there can definitely be a trade-off as it relates to relying too heavily on caffeine. So at high levels of caffeine consumption, and depending on who you are, even at low levels of consumption, some people will experience things like headaches, irritability, anxiety. Uh, and so that's really an important consideration because it is a powerful drug as it relates to its effects on the brain. Now, I also want to say something else very important here, which is that while caffeine can improve symptoms of fatigue, meaning decrease fatigue, it can increase feelings of focus, it can also lead to a number of uh, other issues when we use caffeine as a substitute for good sleep. Caffeine is not equivalent to the benefit that we get from getting good sleep. So if you are relying on caffeine because you're not getting good sleep, this is your call to focus on sleep and not just mask the problem with caffeine consumption. Another variable here is that some people will actually get withdrawal from caffeine if they are regular users. So while again, it can be beneficial for certain people, while again, certain people, myself included, may really enjoy the feeling of a cup or two of coffee, I think it is very important to understand that this is a powerful brain active drug and not to over rely on it and not to consider that it is a replacement for good sleep. Molecule number two that we're going to talk about is related to caffeine. This molecule is called l Theanine. Now, L-theanine is an amino acid, and it's primarily found in the leaves of tea plants, uh, specifically the tea plants that are used to make green, black, and white teas. L-theanine tends to be more abundant in green tea, uh, and it's also found in high-quality matcha tea. Beyond tea, I think it is fascinating to note that it's not just a plant molecule, that L-theanine is actually present in certain mushrooms. There's a bay bolete, which is a type of mushroom that actually has L-theanine in it. And commonly L-theanine is found in places where you'd also find caffeine. That can be seen in supplement form, and as you might expect in the context of tea, you get both L-theanine and caffeine. Uh, some research actually suggests that the combination of L-theanine and caffeine may be more beneficial than L-theanine on its own. So what does L-theanine do in the brain? The main idea is that L-theanine modulates neurotransmitter levels, and it's also been linked to changes in EEG function, meaning it changes brain waves. And in particular, it is thought to promote alpha wave brain activity. When we consume dietary L-theanine, it goes through the blood-brain barrier. And it's interesting that it's chemically similar to the amino acid glutamate. So what it seems to do is competes with glutamate for receptors. Once it binds to a receptor, it produces or increases the production of gamma aminobutyric acid or GABA. And that's thought to be one of the principal uh, inhibitory neurotransmitters in the brain, which helps to explain why it's linked to the feelings of relaxation. So <clears throat> the research would indicate, uh, and again, this isn't incredibly robust data, but it is some data that L-theanine consumption uh, has been linked to increased alertness and reductions in stress and anxiety. We're still investigating, uh, not me personally, but researchers, whether this is replicable, generalizable with larger data sets. As I mentioned before, some data supports at higher doses of this molecule, usually higher doses than you would get from something like a cup of tea, um, as a benefit to enhancing alpha wave uh, formation in the brain. Alpha waves are linked to a slightly relaxed but still attentive mental state. Um, similar to caffeine, but usually in this case in supplement form, because that tends to be where you get the higher doses, L-theanine consumption is linked to increases in jitteriness and headaches. 
And again, I'll bring up the point I made before, which is that any supplement, any food consumption is not going to offset what happens when you don't get a good night of sleep. So if you are struggling with feeling fatigued, don't rely on caffeine or L-theanine. Instead, look to understand why you're experiencing that fatigue. All right, number three, an incredibly interesting food and fungal series of molecules that have a dramatic effect on brain function uh, are something called tryptamines. Tryptamines are found across various kingdoms. They're found in various plants. They're found in fungi. And they have, perhaps of anything here, the most potent and immediate effects on brain function. Now, why is this? It's because these tryptamines basically bind to and modulate receptors for molecules like serotonin. The best known of the tryptamines uh, is probably going to be something related to the chemical structure of dimethyltryptamine. Now, that is a form of tryptamine. Dimethyltryptamine, or DMT, as you might know it, uh, is an active constituent of many psychedelics. Um, DMT is a cornerstone of the ayahuasca beverage, and it's found in a plant, specifically a vine in the Amazon, in which it is found uh, in high concentrations. Um, DMT, again, this tryptamine, is also found not in a plant, but in a host of fungi, specifically uh, mushrooms that contain psilocybin. Now, psilocybin is a form of DMT. Uh, it's another tryptamine. Um, and both DMT uh, as well as the DMT variant psilocybin both bind to and modulate the serotonin receptor pathway. Specifically, we think that these modulate the serotonin to a receptor, which leads to a number of downstream effects, but in the very immediate sense, leads to rapid alterations in state of mind. There are other sources of DMT that occur naturally in the plant kingdom. The yopo tree, for example, contains a uh, tryptamine. These are molecules, generally speaking, that have been used for thousands of years in various traditional and spiritual ceremonies because they have pretty outstanding psychoactive and spiritual effects. We also see that a number of researchers across the country, across the world, are researching tryptamines for therapeutic effects on mental health conditions in particular. So how do these tryptamines found in plants influence the brain? Tryptamines, whether they're in plants or fungi or sometimes in animals, really influence our brains by modulating this serotonin receptor. So let's talk about this for a moment. We have a number of different receptors for serotonin, but the 2A receptor is thought to be incredibly involved in how we feel and how we perceive things around us and how we think. And so when psilocybin or DMT binds to, again, both of these are tryptamines, bind to the 2A receptor. That is thought to change how our brain connectivity works. It's thought to modulate neuroplasticity. And this, in the immediate term, influences how we perceive uh, both visual and audio, audio data. It also changes how we think. It also changes our feelings. Uh, as it relates to pathway-specific effects in the brain, uh, the tryptamine pathway seems to mess with, and I use that a little bit euphemistically, but seems to modulate, I guess would be the better term, the default mode network, which is a series of interconnected neural hubs that are linked to things like self-referential thinking, uh, feelings of ego. And the thought is that some of these molecules can actually disrupt the strength of the default mode network, and that helps to contribute to the therapeutic potential of some of these mo molecules. Now, I personally think it is so interesting that a molecule found in nature leads us to increase our feelings of connection with nature. And this has actually been found for people using psilocybin. After a single use, they feel more connected to nature and that it seems to decrease a little bit of our ego-driven idea that we're super important. So the fact that nature translated into human brains changes how we feel connected to nature, increases that feeling and decreases 
the extent to which we feel locked into us ourselves as being so important, so central to the story is a insanely fascinating way in which nature can modulate us. And if you have any interest in the intelligence of how nature may affect us, there's some really, really interesting correlates to this. The main point here, though, to make is that tryptamines appear to help people uh, break free of certain thought patterns when they're used in a therapeutic setting and appear to increase things like psychological flexibility. These have been linked to some of the potential benefits in conditions like depression and anxiety and PTSD. Now, as I said at the start of this video, and I want to reemphasize now, this is not me advocating for you to go out and pursue these molecules. Rather, we're talking about this in a clinical context, meaning the research suggests that in the right set and setting, when used under correct supervision for the correct population, some of these molecules appear to have a therapeutic benefit, but there are definitely a number of side effects, biological, psychological, and otherwise associated with the consumption of these molecules. Uh, one very important one to consider is that it's quite rare that you find these molecules as a standalone source of tryptamines. They're often part of some sort of a uh, more comprehensive dose of chemical. And so to that end, there is concern, which I think is very reasonable, about the sourcing of some of these molecules, which is one of the reasons, again, that I would highly recommend or you have any consideration for using these molecules, that you make sure that you're actually working with a healthcare practitioner using a protocol that has been studied. The fourth set of molecules, uh, and I'll just make a quick point here. Sometimes I say compound, sometimes I say molecule. Technically, all compounds are molecules. Uh, molecules are, are basically a couple of different atoms that are put together, uh, whereas compounds require different types of elements combined. So in this context of this video, kind of interchangeable. But the last set of molecules that I want to describe are something that are found in all of our plant-based foods and that don't necessarily have as an immediate an effect in terms of what it does to our brain function, but from a cumulative perspective, from a long-term perspective, may actually be one of the most significant groups of molecules in terms of changing our brain function. This group of molecules uh, is called polyphenols. Polyphenols are so named because of their chemical structure. They have multiple phenolic rings and polyphenols constitute a family of 8,000 plus molecules uh, within our foods. They appear to have an outsized effect on brain function when they're consumed longitudinally, so over really months and years. And they have names like resveratrol, which you may have heard about as one of the bioactive molecules in red wine, as well as quercetin, which was very popular for a time when people were wondering about natural remedies for certain viral issues. But the more important point here to make is that this is a group of molecules that have historically only been seen as antioxidants. We're now understanding they have a number of effects on our physiology, including on our brains. Polyphenols um, are the molecules that give fruits and vegetables their color. They also contribute to flavor. In plants, polyphenols act as signaling molecules and defense molecules. So what do they do in our brains? Even though most people think about polyphenols as antioxidants, they act on a host of different pathways within our bodies and our brains. Some polyphenols modulate or change the way our DNA is being used. Other polyphenols influence our immune system, uh, and that includes, at least in preclinical data, meaning in cell-based studies primarily, that polyphenols can alter microglial cells, our brain's immune cells. When we look at uh, animal data, we see that polyphenols have been linked to uh, targeting and decreased expression of pathways that are related to Alzheimer's disease. In particular, we're talking about quercetin in that research. Um, we also know that curcumin, which is the major polyphenol found in turmeric, uh, may increase levels of a molecule called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Uh, that is BDNF, and it's thought to be one of the most powerful molecules that increases the process of healthy neuroplasticity. Now, different from tryptamines, different from caffeine, uh, different from L-theanine, polyphenols are not a group of molecules that are going to, by and large, lead to a rapid effect on our brain function overnight. Now, I'm talking about here in our food, right? So we're not talking about high dose supplementation. We're talking about 
polyphenol content of our food. But over time, what the research would indicate is that people who consume diets rich in polyphenols are at a lower risk for developing a host of brain-related issues, and that includes uh, decreased risk for conditions like dementia. It may also have a mental health benefit. So here we're talking about area under the curve, a longitudinal diet, uh, including diets, for example, like the Mediterranean diet, as well as the diets consumed in these places called the blue zones, which tend to be very rich in polyphenols. Where do you get polyphenols in your diet? The most concentrated source of polyphenols in our diet is spices and herbs. Uh, beyond that, colorful fruits, vegetables, uh, diversity of fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, all rich in these molecules called polyphenols. So with all that said, the really, really interesting and important point here for you to understand is that when you eat food, and here we're talking primarily around plant food, but interesting new research suggests that even animal foods, depending on how those animals were raised, can contain different polyphenols, can contain uh, other brain active uh, nutrients, but really mainly talking about plant-based foods in terms of their ability to modulate our brains, that this can have an outsized effect on how we think, how we act, and how we feel. So at a, a first glance, it's just fascinating to know that what comes from nature can dramatically influence our brain function. At a second level, I think it brings up so many possibilities in understanding how we might be able to use natural molecules found within our foods to beneficially modulate brain function. So I'll end this video now. If there's anything that was really stand out as interesting that you disagreed with, that you'd like to learn more about, comment on this video, let me know, and be sure to subscribe to check out my newsletter, and I will see you again soon. Thanks for watching.